and kick this off. Uh, I'll do my little opening remarks while our last few lunch grabbers grab said lunch. Um, I get the, my name is David Culler. Um, I'm faculty director of I4 Energy, standing in for, I assume, Paul Wright or somebody who would more normally introduce the uh, Wednesday uh, Citrus. But today we have a lot to do about energy and even information and whatnot. Um, so uh, if you feel like you're in Friday, uh, it's really Wednesday. Uh, and in fact, I want to say a word or two more about that before I uh, introduce our, our speaker, Harrison Fraker, today. Um, so for starters, uh, the Friday I for Energy seminar, which will be Elon Catherine Hansen, who is here with us, uh, fresh off the plane from Denmark, I, I imagine, um, speaking on smart energy producing and healthy homes, eight European experiments. That will not be held in this room. That will be held in uh, room 250 downstairs. If you show up in this room, you'll discover yourself in the middle of the E3S, Energy Efficient Electronics uh, Symposium. So you might find it very exciting, but it won't be what you came for. Um, or if you were here with lots of big ideas, I want to remind you that the uh, big idea student proposal competition flyers are in the back. Uh, so, uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce Harrison Fraker to you. Um, many of the elements that I'm going to say are captured in the keywords at the bottom of the slide I, I see there. Um, gee, it seems like only a month ago um, I was in China Tianjin University meeting Harrison. Oh, that was a month ago. Uh, so let me work backwards from that. Um, that was because Tianjin University is in the process of building a new sustainable campus. Want to understand how would they really take all of these issues seriously, the combination of energy, water, waste, and transportation, bringing that all together, and uh, who else would they go to to guide that process and figure out how they do that than Harrison Fraker. So, um, let me work backwards and explain how that meeting. Um, so many of us know Harrison well, a uh, professor of architecture and urban design, former dean of Enmi environmental design here, um, educated as an architect and designer at Princeton and Cambridge. Uh, and uh, many of you may not know, he also directed the Center for Environmental Studies there. Uh, with a gentleman named Sokolo, which you may know from Sokolo Wedges and whatnot. Um, that was also a place where this uh, notion of well-instrumented planned neighborhoods doing in situ studies uh, in the large. Uh, what has really struck me in the presentations, I've had the chance to work with Harrison now for a, a year, I guess, uh, since those lovely dinners at some common friend's house. Um, is the systems view he takes of really understanding in the large how do these collection of fairly complex cycles interact with one another. Uh, and uh, indeed, the story there, I, I was asking Harrison earlier, where did that systems view come from? And the answer there is a thing that uh, is quite common here on the Berkeley campus of the graduate design studio that kicks off a whole area of research, which in fact took place many years ago at Tianjin University, um, really where they began a study of looking at what does it mean to do a uh, transit-oriented neighborhood. And from that, this larger view of really integrating these four very complex cycles together in overall systems view has kind of grown and it's perfectly uh, appropriate then that that would be planned out at the scale of an entire new campus and it's really quite impressive. So with that, please welcome Harrison Fraker. <laughs> Yeah, I'm supposed to be reminded to turn this on. Can you hear me now? Okay. So this talk is going to be about uh, bringing together three areas of work that I've been involved in. One is this idea of eco-blocks, which is to create neighborhoods that are completely resource self-sufficient 
and that work started about six years ago in China. The second thing is I took a sabbatical two and a half years ago after being the dean, and I tried to find any and all sustainable neighborhoods in the world uh, to see how they were working. And I'm going to show you the results of four of those neighborhoods. And then I'm going to show you how all the lessons learned are starting to shape uh, this new campus for uh, Tianjin University. So <clears throat> I, I'm pretty sure I don't have to persuade this audience that we have a really, really serious problem. All the data that we're getting from the climate, from our client friends here on campus, suggests that the carbon problem is accelerating. It's not a, a straight line. And that the impacts on the climate are really dire. And we've already seen tremendous disruption in most of the economic, social, and agricultural systems of the world. It really means we have to take carbon emissions seriously. And this chart shows all the sources, but I'm going to jump to an oversimplified one. Uh, most of you have seen this. If you look at the carbon emissions in the US, basically two thirds of it are involved with buildings and our cars. So any solution to the uh, carbon emissions problem might try to look at these two areas together, both transportation and buildings. This is what generated the EcoBlock idea. There's a circle missing here because this has to do with the buildings. But the key thing is um, making sure that the built environment um, takes transportation and especially access, not mobility, but access to services and goods and so on into account. We developed something called the EcoBlock in China. And the first thing that we did was make sure that the neighborhood was very compact, uh, very walkable, and that it had a bus rapid transit system along a major boulevard that led to most of all of the services. This was in Qingdao. I'm not going to talk about that part of the issue. What I want to talk about is this whole systems thinking. And this is a very early diagram related to it. And uh, the most important thing here, do I have a pointer here, by the way? Well, I suppose I can use this. Uh, the idea is that you take the buildings and you reduce the demand as much as possible through most of the passive strategies that I'll show you in a minute. And then what other possibilities do you have for generating supply? Obviously, there are potential wind machines, photovoltaics on the roof, photovoltaics as shading devices. We've all seen buildings that do this. I think the most surprising thing, however, is the waste stream. This was the big discovery when we started all of this, that if you take the sludge out of a settling tank and deliver it to an anaerobic digester, you take the food waste to the anaerobic digester, and you can take the green waste to the anaerobic digester as well, you have a source of gas that can make electricity. When we first did the calculations, we had this percentage as quite low. You'll see that that's changed dramatically as we've learned more about these systems. At the same time, we're taking the effluent from the septic uh, settling tank and using constructed wetlands to clean the water and recycling the water both as gray water and potable. So let's go through all the obvious things that I'm not going to talk a lot about. If you want to reduce the demand for energy in buildings like these, both low rise and high rise. You need to shade them in the summer. You want to have daylighting so the lights aren't on. You want natural ventilation to reduce the cooling load. You want passive solar, which collects the heat in the thermal mass inside and shuts down at night. You need very high performance envelopes, efficient lighting, efficient appliances, etc. If you do this, you then can 
supply the energy from photovoltaics, wind, and an anaerobic uh, digester system. This is the thinking that we had about four years ago. This is really important because it shows there's no single solution to get to zero carbon. But you can see that all of these strategies here, the optimized facade, natural ventilation, passive heating, daylighting, and efficient appliances can reduce a fairly um, good building already by as much as 40 and in some cases 50%. That means that you can then, you have a much lower number to try to provide the supply by renewable sources, day, um, wind, photovoltaics, and digesters. So having discovered all of this by running the numbers, I wanted to see if there were some real neighborhoods that had tried to do this around the world. I'm only going to show you four, and I'm going to show, you, show them to you very quickly because uh, I want to get to the campus. So these are all projects, uh, two in Germany, one in Kronzberg, which is right outside of Hanover, Vauban, which is in Freiburg, a neighborhood in Freiburg. This is Hammerby in Stockholm, and this is Bo One in Malmö, right across from Copenhagen. In fact, you can see the tall building from Copenhagen. If you look at Vauban, and I'm writing a book about these things. These houses here, which are model passive solar houses, they collect the sun in the winter, it's shaded in the summer, the PVs are on the roof. The PVs are equal to about 40% of the floor area. These houses give back 15% plus energy to the city because there's practically no heating and they're generating more electricity than they actually use. And this is an office building that does the same thing. These are passive solar apartments, which have, you know, they, they actually need about 10 kilowatt hours per meter squared. And obviously the neighborhood is very transit friendly. They use a lot of natural things for shading. And most of all at Vauban, they use a cogeneration system that uses wood chips. Uh, to burn creates both electricity and heat for the neighborhood. I won't go through this. Uh, it, they also have solar on a garage, solar on some houses, and so on. So one of the nice lessons about Vauban is that uh, you can use cogeneration at quite a small scale. These are a thousand, roughly a thousand units by using uh, wood chips as waste, or if you want to call it garden waste. And it also shows that really aggressive passive solar design with PVs can produce uh, energy plus houses. We go to Kronzberg, which has a different system. Um, again, you can see uh, very high density, uh, wonderful place, transit oriented. I'm not going to go through all the details of this. These are passive houses that um, hardly use any energy at all. Harrison, can I ask a quick question? What's, yeah. the, what's the average square footage of all those um, units? Roughly 80 to 100 uh, square meters. OK. So you 80 to 100 square meters. Thank you. Uh, now, the way this works in Kronzberg is there are two wind machines on the hill above the unit. And there's a district cogeneration that runs on natural gas. They provide all the heating for the, all the units. It's a district heating system. And the wind machines make up the gap that the cogeneration doesn't generate in terms of electricity. So it's a pretty wonderful example of where you're using renewables to make up the gap in the cogen system. Uh, Passive homes, they're really the way to go. I'm sure we're going to see a lot of stuff about that on Friday. Um, they're tricky. You have to do them well. We won't get into that detail because I'm more interested in the big picture today. And then also you can see the, the, uh, the idea of matching wind machines with a co-gen plant. Now, BOA-1, that's this project here, um, very compact, again, development here. Uh, wonderful stormwater systems. We could go into it in quite a bit of detail. 
But this is a unique system. They use seawater and groundwater as the heat sink for a heat pump that is powered by a wind machine. So the wind machine provides the electricity for the homes and to run the heat pump. So again, what you have here is a, a, a non-carbon powering source for the heat pump that has a wonderful um, heat sink potential. So you're not going to get this everywhere. Um, but it does show the potential of geothermal uh, opportunities when they exist. So local wind runs the heat pump. Uh, and then they also have evacuated tubes, I didn't show you any pictures, that are also supplementing the district heating. And the evacuated tubes are very, very cost effective. They're the, one of the fastest growing solar applications in the world. You'll see them all over China. Now let me run through Hammerby, which uh, ended up being actually the worst performer, but has some of the best lessons. So Hammerby, this, you probably have all seen this model. It's a little confusing, but let me show you what they do. They take combustible waste and they burn it in a district heating and electricity power plant. So combustible waste and biofuels, additional biofuels, run the uh, district heating and electric system. They do other things. They take the wastewater and uh, they take biogas from the sludge to run cars and cooking, these two sources, and then because the wastewater is still very warm and they don't want to deliver it back to the source at a higher temperature because it's polluting, they take the heat out of it and use it also for the district heating system. So this is very typical Swedish engineers. You capture everything. Uh, you capture even the exhaust gas heat uh, in this district heating system. Now what was really interesting, uh, I, we don't have to go through this, it's all the various plant systems. So what happens here, uh, what they're doing is they're recovering from the sewage both biogas and heat, and they're using combustible garbage to create electricity and hot water. What they planned initially was to have each of the units average, listen to this, 60 kilowatt hours per meter squared per year as their demand. They get from the waste system about 30 kilowatt hours per meter squared per year. They would have had 50% of the energy from waste. Problem is, the units actually ended up using 150 kilowatt hours per meter squared per year. So their actual proportion from the waste streams providing energy was around 20%, much lower. However, that 20% is not a trivial number. So if you look at these things, here was the Vauban. This is the average demand of the units in Vauban measured. So it's 56 kilowatt hours per meter squared per year. Pretty good, pretty damn good, right? They're getting all the heat from the cogeneration plant and mo uh, quite a bit of the electricity. They're getting some from PV, but they have to get some outside electricity because they don't have a wind machine or enough PVs to do it. In Kronzberg, the demand actually was 101. They were trying for 75. The nice thing is they get all the electricity from the wind and the cogen. The trouble is it's burning, it's burning gas, so it's not carbon free. And they're getting all their heating uh, from that system. If you take Hammerby, you can see 146. I averaged it out to 150. If they had been down at the 60 level, this amount that they're getting out of the waste would have been 50%. If you then look at BOA-1, it's really a completely, this is the uh, of all the ones, this is the only one which is 100% renewable because the wind machine and the heat pump from the groundwater systems um, matches the load. I just wanted to point this out. One of the biggest weaknesses in all our work is we can set these goals. We can do all the calculations to show that we set them, but this is what actually happens. 
There's only one place that actually beat the numbers. And you want to know why? Why do you think that happened? Anybody know anything about this neighbor? I, our Copenhagen friend, I'm sure, does. The homeowners were involved in the design of these systems, knew exactly how they worked, and were invested in beating this number. So they maintain it and take care of it. And it's a lesson for neighborhoods. Neighborhoods can do this. All of these other neighborhoods, uh, well, for instance, Bow One had to get built very, very fast because it was an expo. Same with Hammerby. They were trying to get things done. So the construction's not as good as it should be. OK, I want to go to a, a campus. This is the new campus at Tianjin. It's for 20,000 students. It's a com community for 40,000 people. Let me quickly, so this is a very unusual campus plan, and I think quite wonderful. The main campus core is like a urban street. It has all the um, living services, all the undergraduate classrooms and labs and offices are along here, along with housing, which you can see on the tops of some of these units and here and here. This is the library, this is performance halls, etc. Then you have the colleges, which each have their own square and research facilities and offices. Then you have dormitories between. You see this? And then there's a park system uh, around the whole thing. So every, camp, every college has its own uh, civic square, its own garden. Think of the backs of the cam in England. Um, and it's a very urban setting. I hope all of you can see this. So this is a diagram of where we are in terms of the systems thinking for this campus. The wonderful thing is that the city and the campus will build an infrastructure that has an electrical grid, a gas grid, a city water, city gray water, uh, a city sewage or water treatment, city storm water, uh, they have a city waste uh, recycling and a city hot water district system. So this is a campus that in the streets, it has all the services and technically it would be provided by the city. And you know what would happen is most of the electricity would come from coal and the storm water would just be piped elsewhere. Uh, the city water, the gray water, I'm not sure where it's coming from. The gas, again, is natural gas coming from somewhere, etc. So we're proposing instead that electricity be provided by a cogeneration plant that burns combustible waste and gas from an anaerobic digester. So it's providing electricity along with some portion of solar and some portion of wind. Okay, that's the electrical. The gas is coming from an anaerobic digester, which is using organic waste, sludge, and maybe some of the green waste. Now, the interesting thing about green waste, the pulpy stuff you burn, the really juicy green stuff you put into the digester. Now, for simplicity, you might put all of it into the combustible waste stream. Um, what you get is compost out the bottom, very high quality compost. The gas can run the cogen, or it can feed the, um, you know, the, the uh, campus grid. What about gray water? So let's first go to sewage. What happens in the sewage system in, in China? In the buildings, there's a settling tank. A truck comes around and takes the sludge out, and it goes to be composted for night soil, currently, if we're lucky. The effluent then goes to a sewage treatment plant and is dumped afterwards. What we're proposing is that the sludge goes to the anaerobic digester and that the effluent goes to some form of local living machine. Now, do you all know what those are? I mean, I didn't come to talk about a living machine. It's a very simple device where you cycle the effluent through uh, tanks that have gravel in them and plants and it sits there, 
is pumped to the next one or goes by gravity to the next one and the next one. And in the end, the organisms, both aerobic and anaerobic, take all of the um, organic pollution out of it. And when you're finished, you have very high quality gray water. Okay? So, um, so what can happen then is the living machine can then put the water that comes out of that back into the gray water system. And the gray water system is used for irrigation, it's used for toilets, it's used for um, uh, actually some of the washing mechanisms. The storm water is filtered on the site and goes into the canal and any overflow would go to the city. If we look at the city water cycle, um, I'm sorry, city waste cycle, the combustible waste is collected and goes to the to the uh, cogen, and the organic waste is collected and goes to the uh, anaerobic digester, and all of the other recyclables go to a recycling center. And you can see that the cogen brings the hot water back to this system, and there are some cases where evacuated tubes add to the hot water or potentially geothermal. So what does this look like? I mean, I'm I'm going to go through this really fast because I want to go to the numbers in just a second. So just to show you the electric, how the diagram works, they have a transformer uh, from the city feeding the system. Here's the cogen feeding the system. We have solar on the roofs that can be either feeding the system or feed the building first, and then we have wind machines. Okay. If you look at the hot water, Hot water comes from the cogen, or it comes from evacuated tubes, probably on the dormitories, because uh, the energy for showers is the major, that is one of the major demands for dormitory energy. The gas system, pretty straightforward. Uh, it either comes from the city or it comes from our gas uh, out of the anaerobic digester. The tap water is just supplied. Hopefully, that's all they'll need, which is only really 15% of water use. Uh, if you take the sewer system, what's really interesting here is you can see what we can do is we can have living machines all over the campus. We tap into the sewer effluent, run it through the living machine, and put it back in the gray water. So it's a plug and play system. You don't have to do it all at once. If you look at the gray water, it's circulated to all the buildings and for the landscape. If you look at the waste system, it's trucked to the cogen place. That's the, both the organic and the um, combustible waste. And the stormwater system, everything is filtered on the site and helps to feed this. So the water level is maintained by stormwater and by the gray water system uh, so that this, uh, we never have a water problem here. It's also very clean. Okay, I wanted to show you, some, I, I come over to the engineering building and I have to show you the numbers here because they're pretty interesting. If you take this campus, they're distributing space at roughly 30 square meters per person for everything. Dormitories, classrooms, laboratories, everything. Okay? So if you multiply that number times 40,000 people, you come up with the total square footage of the campus. And it's burned 30 yeah. If you average energy demand in China for campus buildings, and these are more recent campus buildings, is roughly 100 kilowatt hours per meter squared per year. Okay? Now, that might surprise a lot of you since we're in the 200 to 300 range. All right? But that's the case in China. So obviously, if you multiply this all out, you get 3,000 kilowatt hours per person per year as the demand. If you use energy efficiency, and by that I mean really good daylighting, so the lights aren't on very often, really good passive solar, very good insulation, and tight buildings, you can reduce that number by 50%. So 
So if you multiply this out, 30 meters squared per person times this amount, this is the total energy per person used per year. It breaks down into roughly 20 kilowatt hours per meter squared for electricity, roughly 30 for heating. You should know Tianjin is like Boston. It has a really cold, long winter. It's something like 6,000 degree days, if you all know what that means. It's, it's up there. Um, and by the way, the measured data on campuses right now is not, so if you do this proportionally, this would be 40 kilowatt hours per meter squared uh, if it was part of this number. Right now, the average on campuses is 17 kilowatt hours per meter squared for electricity. So we're being safe here, even after all the conservation. So how do we get supply? Okay. Here's the key. These numbers really are exciting, I think, because it shows. So if you take combustible municipal solid waste it, has, it makes heat and it makes electricity. There are 1.2 kilograms per person per day. This is a fairly good number. It correlates with our numbers from EPA. It could be higher in China. I'm, we're not sure. Don't know exact, the exact numbers. But if you use the efficiency for uh, all the plants that are in Copenhagen or in uh, uh, Stockholm or in Germany, use those efficiency numbers, you get 886 kilowatt hours per person per year from this waste stream in heat, and you get 202 kilowatt hours per person per year in electricity. And that's straight off of performing uh, cogen um, combustible waste systems. If you then look at the biogas from sludge and food, it's not as impressive, but it's important. You get about 17 kilowatt hours per year from the sludge and about for heating and about 10 for electricity. And in the food, you get about 35 and 21. So we get 938 kilowatt hours per person per year from the waste. Did you remember the number? For heating? It was 900. So the waste system, both the combustible waste and the organic waste, provides all the heating for the campus, straight out. You know, I can go back. See? 900 right here. Okay. So now, and we've gotten 233 of the roughly 600 for electricity out of the waste, or about a third. So what do we need to do? If we add solar, photovoltaic cells, two meters, two square meters per person, that's basically one panel a person. You know, one of the basically three by six panels. One per person, this is how much energy a panel generates in Beijing per year, per square meter. So we're getting 200 kilowatt hours per person per year if we supplied that much in PVs. So how much is that? Two meters squared out of, you know, each person is 30 meters. It's a tiny percentage. It's about 6% of the floor area. So you're talking about having maybe a quarter to a third of the roofs in PVs. Very manageable. Also, if you then have two, two megawatt wind machines, they produce about uh, 9,000 megawatt hours per year. That's um, data from the area. Or roughly 225 kilowatt hours per person per year. So if you take the waste, the solar, and the wind were at 658. So if we go back, and we only need 600. So it's perfectly possible, this demonstrates that it's perfectly possible if you start with the waste stream to get all the heating out of it, 
about a third of the electric. And you just need to add either more wind machines to do it all in wind, more solar if you want to do it all in solar, or some combination of the two. I would argue that it would be a good idea to do both because then you can, um, you know, because of the matching of the timing of these things. So I'm going to end there. So the simple thing, the, the, the lesson here is when you're operating at the scale of a campus, 40,000 people, the waste streams are valuable enough to make the job of energy efficiency and renewables much more manageable uh, at that scale and a very, very good option. So it means that when we develop our neighborhoods in the future, we could do it as scalable, incremental, distributed systems like this. And we could even go back in and retrofit neighborhoods um, if we wanted to, especially uh, mining the waste streams. Right now, in the United States, uh, while we're improving our recycling, basically what we're doing is recycling the metal, glass, paper, um, etc. We're not using any of the food waste, and we're still throwing away almost 60% of our waste. And you can see right here from these numbers that it's a gold mine if we really want to get to zero carbon. It is really the secret, I would argue. It's one of the secrets anyway. You have to do all of these other things well, but if you decide to involve the whole system, the waste stream, the water, etc., you can really get down to zero carbon without too much uh, difficulty. So thank you very much. So I have lots of questions. Yes? How does the seasonality play into this? In the summer, you don't need any. In the winter, you need a lot of energy. Your green waste isn't even over the course of the year. Right. How does all that work out in the emergency of the electricity? So the nice thing about this is um, if you look at the. Yeah. yeah, I'll repeat the question. The, the question is, how does seasonality affect this? You're having 900, 900 kilowatt hours per person year of heat, but in the winter you probably you might need more, and in the summer you might not need any at all. And similarly with some of your, your waste streams, they're not even across the course of the year. Green waste would happen right. uh, more in certain periods than other periods. So let me try to answer this. Uh, so the 900 kilowatt hours per person per year is... Uh, what, what is necessary for the whole winter, okay? So yes, you're right. If you look at the generation, um, we have more uh, heat in the summer. We have enough in the winter, we have more in the summer. We, ha we have to throw away heat in the summer. Now remember, some of that heat can be, it has to be used for the domestic hot water system. But uh, we are basically throwing away heat in the summertime. Um, if you look at the waste streams, um, most of the combustible waste uh, comes from just the, the refuse from the campus. So the green waste is not a big proportion. Yes, you would have more in the summer. Uh, that's true. Uh, and we still have to work it out month by month. We haven't done that detail. The nice thing is, um, if you look at the load profiles, David uh, Culler and I were at Tianjin, and they've instrumented something like 32 buildings on campus, and they're starting to show the load profiles of these buildings. And the interesting thing is that most of the buildings, the classrooms, most of the laboratories, etc., have a very high electric load during the day, which is when we have sun or sky that can co uh, collect energy. So we have a pretty good match there. And the nice thing is we still have a pretty good base load from this waste stream, which is continuous. So yes, we have intermittency with the solar and the wind, but we have a good base load with the uh, waste. It acts more or less like a waste uh, as a base load. And obviously, if we had to, what you would do is you would borrow gas from the city if, it, if, it, if there wasn't enough waste at that time uh, to make up the, the base load. Um, so this is, yes, this is, a, this is an annual 
accounting of the system, and we'd have to, we have to look at it in greater detail month by month. Um, other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, first of all, let me begin by honoring uh, Jason Traeger, who I don't think is, hmm? Anyway, well, he's a, ze he's a zealot who's taught me about the importance of composting from, from this building. But I think I learned from you then, and it worried me, that even though we're making a big effort to compost and be careful, did you just teach me that it just goes off and is just dumped somewhere after all? And it's, not, it's really not used effectively. I, I, so I, to teach me what really happens to that composting uh, stream when it goes to... I think com composting is terrific for your garden, uh, you know, in your backyard, but you're basically throwing the energy away. Uh, and the nice thing about uh, the system that we're proposing here, this, this digester system, is you get the compost anyway, but you've taken the energy out. And that is really, really important because you saw the numbers. It's not trivial. Yeah. So, so if I wanted to do my job better, should I have an energy uh, unit out back in the... I think the lesson for this campus is if you took the waste stream from our food uh, services and from all the buildings and had an anaerobic digester, um, you could uh, probably provide all the gas necessary for the campus. But, but seriously, could we, is there a small unit we could do just for this building and, and feed it back in? That like, I can't. It's like a solar panel or yeah. a uh, I don't a know at what scale the they or? have those. I think they have fairly small scale, but I don't know. Three sets worth looking into. <laughs> yeah. Uh, on the electric system, did you look into direct DC systems and a DC grid, a microgrid, and a smart grid kind of controls? Um, well, l let me s step back for a second and say, uh, we're working on this with an interdisciplinary team of people from Berkeley here and from Tianjin. And I'm sure when we start talking about the electrical system in, in detail, we're going to talk a little bit about the DC. But um, I don't have an answer for that. You should talk to David about this, or you should talk to some of the people at LBNL. I certainly understand uh, how nice it would be to have the direct DC from the PVs feeding a DC system in the buildings. But um, I don't know the engineering detail enough to, to, to know how feasible it is. And this one assumes. Uh, that we're converting everything to alternating current and doing it the normal way, which means we're taking it as DC, converting it to alternate, converting it back to DC when we run the computers and so on, um, which is, you know, I wish we could be better than that, but I'm not quite sure how to do it. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> Hi. Hi, Harrison. Nice to see you. Uh, um, so I, I thought actually East Bay Mud made it methane out of the they, they, they're, they're doing it out of the sludge. What oh, I would okay. argue in the Bay Area, every sewage treatment plant should add a food processing uh, plant to their system and increase their gas output. That okay. would be my suggestion okay. in the Bay Area. Okay. This is what I mean. These lessons here can be retrofitted to a lot of our existing systems in very good ways. And you know in Berkeley we're already separating the green waste and our, and our food right, waste. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a no-brainer in my we view. We should do it. We yeah, should. we should absolutely do it. So uh, my, my question is really related to, I'm maybe pronouncing it, was it Vauban that had the community co-design? Yeah. Because I'm really interested in community co-design for sustainable communities. And it seems to me that is what we really need to do at Berkeley. But what were the, could you give more details on the elements of the co-design and the success? So what they did, um, I haven't finished that chapter yet in my book, but in broad outline what happened is this was an old French <laughs> Uh, military site that was given uh, back to Germany. And Vauban wanted to develop this. So they invited cooperatives to form uh, to get pieces of the overall plan. And I forget how many cooperatives there were, but for the site, let's just say there were at least a dozen, maybe there were 18 cooperatives. They worked together to set their energy target guidelines and then they, they hired their own 
architect developer team to work on it. And then they work together to design these systems. So the neighborhood is made up of 12 to 18 separately designed um, projects all integrated in the master plan. And uh, what's wonderful about that, uh, a similar situation without the cooperative, but a similar situation in BO1 where the master plan divided the site up into something like 55 development parcels and each one was done by a different developer architect team. So every project had the personality of those teams. So you got the richness of a real city that's built over time, even though this was all done at once. But there were some high-level principles. Yeah, there was overall principles that guided it. Yeah. Hi. Um, do you think there are, to get to zero carbon, do you think there are strong geographic limitations in the sense that, like, Tianjin is very different from, say, a U.S. city in the Great Lakes region is very different from, like, the American Southwest? Le um, great question. Uh, I'm sure there are. The nice thing about this is look at the sources of renewables that we're using. Every place probably has very similar waste flows, okay? And so once you start with the waste flows as the, as the kind of primary landscape that you're operating in, then you mine the rest of the climate, uh, assets and liabilities. If it's got wind, you use it. If it's got sun, you use it. If it's got geothermal, you use it. It may be a situation where there's no sun, no geothermal, no wind, then you'll only have the waste. But that's pretty damn good, isn't it? You're getting all the heating. Uh, now, what about air conditioning? Uh, you know, Tianjin has a very low air conditioning load, and it's done primarily with individual units, very carefully monitored. So it's part of the electrical uh, load base. In other places where air conditioning is a problem, I think it's a very different game. And maybe then the excess heat, certainly uh, that this one gentleman asked about, is useful in the summer if you want to do an absorption chiller system. But I haven't looked at that in any detail yet. And certainly in Tianjin, they're not interested in that. They don't want district cooling because they don't think the load is big enough to uh, warrant it. So I have a um, slightly different uh, simplification coming as a result of this talk. So uh, I can remember how many days there are in a year, but how many hours there are in a year is a little, little complicated for me. Um, so let me boil it down a little further. What your numbers say is for each and every one of us that set foot on campus, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we consume 400 watts. Um, That's our if you our average, which is kind of an interesting number. Yeah. On average, every residence is That's a kilowatt, right. 25 hours, kilowatts a day with about two and a half people, yeah. so the other 400 watts. Okay, so my picture, each of us should walk around thinking that our footprint at home is about 400 watts. Mm -hmm. Our footprints on campus is about 400 watts, so we're getting this picture like that commercial with the umbrella. So right. we should be wandering around with a kilowatt of constant production, while the other 200 is the transportation and the latent right. uh, energy in that. Okay, so that's what we need to do is, and what many of these questions are touching at is, of course, that's the average case analysis. And my constant, I'm, a, we're, each and every one of us is an electric teapot, a toaster oven, a hair dryer, a kilowatt. You don't have the hair, but you like tea. <laughs> and between all those places we set foot in, we have to make that up. Yeah. One, one way or another. You By the way, this room doesn't, doesn't make it. Uh, no, and, and part of what's in the underlying uh, questions is nothing individual makes it. Each one of our demands varies tremendously. Each one of those sources varies. And your systems view is saying at some scale, with some control and some storage discipline, how do you put them together so that on average, on average it works out? Right. And it's kind of useful. We're wandering around as a hairdryer. Right. And, you know, this is getting you to zero carbon. And the reason why I, I've, I've been fascinated with can we get there reasonably 
and at what scale. And the reason is because in all our new development, that's what we ought to be doing if we're really going to try to cut down our carbon emissions. So yes, if you wanted to say, look, maybe um, on average, you know, I have such a carbon footprint, we could have all these numbers be higher if, if we allotted a certain amount of carbon to every individual on the planet at, say, 9 billion people, which is supposed to be the, the average, then we could go back and see. Uh, this would be better than that, but then we'd ha have to go back and see what we would have to do to what we already have, which is huge. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Here, here. Uh, my question is, how feasible is this system uh, economically? Because you have, have to install a lot of new system like the anaerobic digester, and okay. of course you, you can save a lot of energy from the PV over time. Just have you done those calculations? Um, I've done them multiple times, not entirely for this one, but let me tell you the ones that I know about. First of all, getting the 50% reduction is a cost plus. You make money doing that. And the McKenzie report graph shows that. All the, in it, all the passive solar, all the uh, tighter buildings, all the good insulation, all of that stuff is a cost plus. I mean, you're, you're making money doing that. The waste to energy system also makes money for the, just the straight combustible municipal solid waste. The biogas uh, digester, some of these new systems that we've looked at are also very close. Maybe they cost a little bit more uh, per kilowatt hour than currently being delivered. Now, clearly the wind and the solar are the ones that are a little more expensive than uh, current electrical rates. The wind is closer, so you might choose to do the wind. And we know that we have to get the PV solar down to basically a dollar a watt. And we're about three or four magnitudes away from that, right? Nonetheless, it, I want to show this to show that when we get there, we can make these communities completely run on their own. That, that's the main purpose. And you could argue that ethically, if we use all of the savings from the conservation and the waste, uh, combustible waste system, and invest that in the things that are more expensive, we break even and we're, and we're zero carbon. You could also make that argument. The thing that really bothers me the most about this is what we're, what, what we're comparing costs to. In China, the electricity is incredibly subsidized. You know, it, it costs way more to produce the electricity than they charge. In, 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 in my understanding. And in this country, you have embedded investments in all the infrastructure that was built a long time ago. So you're getting the price that you pay now has that advantage. If you compared the wind machines to a new coal-fired power plant, including all the infrastructure, the power lines that get it there and the substations and all of that, and you did a real first cost balance to balance comparison, I think they're a lot closer. But I haven't done that yet. Any of you have? Am I, is, is that a false assumption? It, and if we uh, want to figure in the environmental costs and the sure. uh, savings of the millennia of our forefathers who went before us, um, then it's almost sure to come out. But not only are we out of that, but we're out of time. Okay. And it was a great chance to thank Harrison. Thank you. That was a great talk. Thanks. Well, it's fun. Those numbers are really interesting.